today. Um, so uh, for information on how we treat your data, please refer to our privacy policy, uh, but this will be uploaded onto the website and made available for other people. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, if you can use the chat uh, function to ask questions as we go along, we'll take several pauses as we go um, and answer those questions. Um, but yeah, please feel free to use that ch chat function. So can everybody see my screen at the moment? Yes. Good. Okay. Right. So firstly, I'd like to introduce your presenters this afternoon. Um, we have Alison Coleman, Project Officer for Community Grants. We'll be taking you through some of the paperwork that's required on the programme. Uh, we also have Heidi Price, another Project Officer on Community Grants, and she'll be taking you through all the claiming if you're lucky enough to get the grant. Um, also with us this afternoon is Becky Thornton. Uh, she's from Voluntary Impact Northamptonshire. Um, and they are very much involved in helping you during this pre-application stage. So we'll hear a lot from Becky um, this afternoon. And my name's Gail Parker. I'm the project manager for the Community Grants Programme. And I will be kicking things off uh, in the next slide. So let's get on and um, talk about actually why we're here. Um, so Community Grants uh, Programme, we're going to talk firstly about um, how this all fits into SEMLET priorities and where the ESIP allocation came from in the first place. You'll certainly be asked within your applications to reference some of this information, so it's, uh, it's a good idea to make a few notes during this bit. Um, the programme itself um, is ESF funded, as you know and it's managed by the ESFA. So just to put a little bit of context around that. Uh, so the Community Grants Programme um, came into being uh, two years ago, and it's part of the uh, ESF allocation that the South East Midlands area was allocated back in 2014 now. And originally we got around uh, 79.5 million. Um, and the program was originally meant to run until 2020, but is extended now till 2023. So projects at the moment we're looking for uh, can run up to 2023. Ideally, they should be up to 12 months. Um, specifically, under this um, uh, ESF uh, support, we're looking to support social inclusion as a prerequisite for the creation of a just and cohesive society in which each individual can fully participate and realize his or her potential. Our strategy supported activity under the thematic area of social inclusion and embedded priority six, which is around tackling social and economic exclusion as a cross-cutting theme um, to create inclusive opportunities uh, for all and ensure sort of real change for the South East Midlands communities. And we'll come on to how we're actually embedding that within our economic recovery strategy in a moment. Uh, the funds under this area are specifically there to respond to the strategic objectives of uh, the SEMLEP social inclusion strategy. Um, and you can find this on our website as well. Um, but primarily to un address the underlying causes of differences in employment levels and worklessness in some areas and um, for particularly disadvantaged groups. And we'll go through those in a bit more detail as well. Also to address the persistent pockets of need uh, ranging from urban areas uh, with multiple and complex uh, deprivation to rural areas which are vulnerable to sort of economic and demographic change, uh, particularly given the situation that we're in at the moment. Uh, so we had a number of opt-ins under the ESF, and one of those was through the Education and Skills Funding Agency, the ESFA, uh, where their remit was to deliver skills training based on the LEPS skills need. And again, we've got a LEPS skills strategy, which can be found on our website. Um, but this includes adult skill training, skills training for employability, which through community grants can give organisations like yourself 10 to 20k 
um, and it doesn't require match funding. So that's what we're talking about this morning, up to 20K grants. Um, as I say, we've recently um, signed a contract extension with the ESFA, so the programme will now run until March 2023, um, projects um, <laughs> and 12 months duration. Um, now, a little quirk here, because the contracting for ESIF or, or the ESF was done back in 2013-14, it means that the geography that we're covering under community grants is slightly different to where we are now. Um, so as you may see from the map on, on this slide, uh, it still includes Aylesbury Vale and Cherwell, which are no longer part of the LEP, but it does mean we can do delivery in those two areas. However, unfortunately, East North Hants and Wellingborough aren't because they weren't part of the original contraction. So just to be aware, if you were thinking about delivering in East North Hants and Wellingborough, you won't be able to, um, but you can deliver in Cherwell and Aylesbury. So, as I mentioned, the community grants is also part of our economic recovery strategy in SEMLEP um, post COVID, um, where we're talking about um, what priorities that we're looking at and what types of projects on the next slide. So that gives you a little bit of context as to why we're all here today and how the money came about. But it's it's useful to note those priorities because uh, we do ask for that as part of your application. Okay, so what types of projects um, can we fund? So uh, the types of projects that we're looking for, as the slide says, we're looking for projects that engage with the hardest to reach communities. Um, we'll cover that what those are in the next slide in a bit more detail. Um, but the projects themselves need to develop confidence, self-esteem, enhance employability skills and transferable life skills. Um, and there are some examples of the type of activities the project might cover uh, on the slide. However, I would say that we do we are still looking for projects that can deliver safely during COVID. So that might mean more online delivery, um, but obviously certainly socially distanced, particularly if you're starting in May time, which gives us a bit more flexibility then. And we're looking probably for these projects to start um, early May now, by the time the process has, has been gone through, that's where we're going to be uh, ending up probably. So starting to deliver, in May, hopefully we'll have a, a bit more of a relaxed regime, but just in case, you need to make sure that your project is uh, deliverable during COVID. Um, so which target groups? Um, so the slide here goes through quite a lot of those in depth. Um, so uh, people with disabilities, households on a single income with dependent children, the homeless, uh, those from ethnic minority groups, ex-offenders and women returning to work. However, as I said, this actually is going to be quite um, uh, pivotal to our economic recovery strategy. And we've identified that those in most need in this region at the moment are those over 50 who have recently been made redundant. And particularly in Luton, we've got um, very high levels of redundancy in Luton. Um, so it's not to say we won't look at the other areas, but we're very much focusing on, um, uh, on that category for our economic recovery strategy. Okay, okay so I just wanted to give you a, a little okay. overview of a couple of projects that we've already uh, run through Community Grants, just to give you an idea of the type of um, projects that have also been successful uh, in delivering during COVID. Um, so this is a case study here of um, uh, something we call BUDS, the Buckinghamshire Disability Service, um, and they were very much oh, sorry. Um, they were very much uh, geared up to deliver face to face in the early stages, but when COVID hit, they were very good at uh, pivoting that and delivering everything online, which actually gave a lot more confidence to some of the people that they were working with to become more uh, IT literate as well. So there's a nice um, uh, 
uh, quote there, in the last four months, I've achieved more personally than I thought was possible. I have a newfound confidence in and skills. So that's the kind of thing we'd be looking for is delivering that sort of activity online during COVID. So the next case study we've got um, is again an example of uh, a project that was originally set up uh, for the over 50s. And as you can see from the picture to be delivered face to face. But again, um, when the pandemic hit, um, they pivoted really quickly to using Zoom. And again, that gave them uh, a newfound confidence, particularly those um, over 50 to be using um, new technology and embracing that new technology uh, as a way of working going forward. So uh, after a few technical glitches, it says there, all but two of the learners were online. So obviously it doesn't work for everybody, but um, they were very successful at pivoting their project. So that's hopefully given you an idea of a couple of the types of projects that we have funded and have worked really well during COVID. So what does your project have to deliver? So obviously we can't give you money for nothing. So there are a few deliverables that we'd be looking for. So the first one of those are um, our STO1s, which are our learners. So that would be a, a learner assessment and plan. Um, and typically people are delivering between um, 15 and 30 of those within their project. It does vary depending on, on um, the type of intervention you're doing, um, but that's a, a really rough uh, uh, ballpark. Uh, we're also looking for uh, pg ones which is progression into employment. So at least 17% of your STO1s, your learners, they need to be progressing at the end of the project into employment, which we appreciate it at the moment is difficult, but we would still be looking for you to make that commitment. And then finally, we'd be looking for our pg 3 so 14% of your cohort uh, progressing into education. Um, and we'll go through what uh, constitutes both employment and education uh, a little bit later on. It is worth noting, though, as we do quite often get this on applications, that um, volunteering is not an output under community grants. It can be part of your programme, but it's not an output. So it has to be into paid employment and not volunteering. So I'm just going to pause there for a moment and have a quick look at the uh, uh, chat bar. Um, so we've got one come up. What is considered moving into employment? Is it full time? It's not actually. So part time employment also counts, but we will go through that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, so the same with education. Um, yes, so there are a minimum requirements for education. Um, it's, um, and we'll go through those in a little bit more detail uh, shortly. So any more questions before I move on? Okay. Right, so I'm going to hand over now to Becky, who's going to take you through provider eligibility. Thanks, girl. Um, hello, everyone. So, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, eligibility. So this is for your organisation, um, just to make sure that uh, you fit the criteria um, before, before you um, commit to applying. And um, it does say all this in the guidance, but I am going to go through it because um, each round we get quite a number of people who are applying who, who unfortunately don't fit this this basic criteria and I'd really rather uh, stop it now um, rather before you put the time um, and the resources into, into filling out a full application if, if you're not going to be in the first place. So um, your organisation has to support people in the South East Midlands and Gail has already talked about the slight anomaly in the in the geography there so make very certain that you um, that you will be working with people based in in the geography that that, that Gail detailed earlier on. Um, your organisation has to have less than £300,000 annual income and fewer than 50 full-time employees. 
Um, and if you sort of have a parent company that um, that is bigger than than either of those, then then unfortunately you're not eligible either, unless you can show that you have complete independence um, from those organisations. So I mean they're they're sort of all fairly self-explanatory, but they are pretty much non-negotiable. So so do please um, take all of those things into account before you start. Come on to the next slide, please. Oh, oh, I've I'm covering up with myself. Let me just move my cross. Right, sorry. Um, okay, so to continue on the eligibility, do you have a constitution of rules saying how your organisation is managed and what it does? So you might not call it a constitution. It's your governing document. It's your webinars. It's whatever it might be. Um, as long as you have some kind of formal document um, that that gives us some information about your, your organisation and how it's managed. And you will have to submit that with your application. So you do need to have, have that as a written document somewhere. Um, you'll need a UK bank account, obviously, so that uh, the um, grant can be paid into that um, if you get to that stage. Um, there are uh, requirements around insurance. Um, the uh, minimum levels are laid out in the guidance, but I think I'm right in saying that they're a million pounds each as a minimum uh, that you need to be insured for on those. Um, as I said before, your organisation needs to be legally constituted. Um, you do need a legal structure that demonstrates that you're a BCSC organisation. And again, this is quite clearly laid out in the guidance um, it, but we do have questions around it because obviously um, there are many, many different structures that BCSE organisations can have and that's fine. So um, have a look at the guidance, but basically when it comes down to you don't have to be a registered charity, uh, you might be a CIC, you might be um, a, a, an unregistered voluntary organisation, those things again they're okay as long as you're not profit making. Mm -hmm. um, there are exceptions, so we can't um, fund sole traders and we wouldn't fund companies limited by, by shares um, and private companies. If you have any doubt at all about your um, your structure, then, then please ask. Again, do it at an early stage so that we don't waste your time going through all the application if, if you're not going to be eligible uh, because of that. So if you're unsure, have a look at the guidance in the first instance, and if you're still not certain about where you sit within that, then then please ask, and we can try and sort that out for you. Uh, Becky, we have got a specific question. Can it be a limited company? Um, now, the, again, it depends, <laughs> which I know is not a terribly helpful answer. So it can be, if you're limited by guarantee, um, then that's one thing. If you're limited by shares and people take profits from those those shares then no so it, it it is a little bit ambiguous and it depends on on your exact structure so as i say have a look at the list in the guidance but if it's still not clear after that then please get in touch and we can look at your constitution and look at how you um you've been created as an organization and we can make a decision from there great thank you becky so if we move on to the next slide um, we're going to, I'm just going to take you through the actual application process now. Um, and uh, once you've checked your eligibility, so do go to our website um, and check your eligibility against the criteria. Um, and once you're on the website, there is a section in there uh, under eligibility, uh, which you can actually make your expression of interest. So the first step is just to make your expression of interest. Um, and then that comes through to Becky and she will um, send you an email with uh, some more information on and the offer to have a chat with her about your application. Um, we can also send you blank application forms so you can uh, have a little go at that beforehand. Um, but it is uh, uh, as well to give Becky three working days so uh, she's got a bit of a chance to come back to you with any questions. Um, so. Becky's very much there to uh, talk through your projects, as she says, and give additional advice. And she'll also let you know if the project is eligible and will give you some help with filling in the application form. Um, you don't have to do this all at once. It can be over a period of time, but do give her plenty of time before the submission date um, because uh, we don't want you going right up to the end and then missing the actual deadline, which is at 5 p.m., on the 12th of March. So any applications that we get after that, unfortunately, 
uh, won't be um, uh, accepted at that point. So make sure you get it in by 5 p.m. We had a couple in at 5.05 .05 last time and we unfortunately just couldn't help them. If you have any technical difficulties, then just get in touch with us uh, at that point. Back over to you now, Becky. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to run through um, some, some basic uh, general points around making your application. And again, apologies if some of these sound relatively straightforward, but you, they always catch someone out. So <laughs> I'd rather go through it and, and, and emphasize some of this than, than, than not. So there are a number of due diligence questions that you need to um, go through and many of them are yes or no's. So just make sure you read carefully the, the specific question that you're asking and, and figure out what the, the correct answer for your organization is. Um, as Gail mentioned earlier, you will need to describe your project and how it fits with uh, some priorities. So please, please do refresh your mind as to as to what those are um, before beforehand, so that you can uh, show um, how you will contribute to, towards fulfilling those. You'll need to demonstrate how your work will help participants to progress. Um, I think I'll say on here really. Um, don't take anything for granted. Um, uh, don't assume that it will be obvious because it's not always. Um, it's one thing when you've sort of lived and breathed your, your project and you know, created it from the concept up to, the, to formulating it. And if you think it's pretty obvious how the work that you do will um, support your, your participants and, and, and help them to progress into the outcomes, but please, lay that out for us, demonstrate exactly how what you're doing will, will relate to them and, and to their progress. Um, make sure you read the questions and answer specifically what's being asked. Um, give enough detail to, to clearly illustrate your response. Again, with the participant journey, um, a lot of the time, I think, uh, very easy when you're filling in the application that to, to, to think of it as obvious. Um, and it might be to you, it might even be to us, but that's not really the point. You need to write it down. You need to make it very clear um, exactly uh, what the experience your participant will have throughout the, the project and throughout their time with you. So um, don't, as I say, don't make any assumptions about prior knowledge. You have to assume that the people reading your application know nothing about your organization, know nothing about the, the people that you're working with, Make sure you tell us everything that, that we need to know. Um, remember as well that questions are scored separately. Um, so you do need to put relevant information in each one. Even if you think you've mentioned it elsewhere, if it's relevant to that question, then it's going to be the um, Also, I would say look at the weighting for the scores. The scored questions are uh, um, made quite obvious which ones the scored questions are and each of them are given a, given a weighting so for example if you see that a question is worth 30 percent of your total score for your application then obviously um you need to to, to think about that and, and think that that therefore then requires quite a substantial amount of information if you give us sort of four lines for something that's worth 30 percent then you're not going to get 30% of your total scores, you know, it's not going to be very high. You need to make sure that you really think through about um, giving us sufficient information and, and everything that you need. Um, and then there's a section on staff, so you need to be able to detail the staff delivering the project um, and the projected costs um, and the budget around that as well. Okay. Um, again, some of these might seem obvious, but I'm not going to apologise for that again. Um, don't forget to think carefully about the work that you're planning and its relation to the priorities and outcomes. You might have a fantastic idea for a project, but if it doesn't contribute um, to the summit priorities, if it doesn't clearly um, help people progress into employment and education, then this isn't the fund for you, I'm afraid. Um, and again, we can try and point you in the right direction of, of other possible funds that might be more appropriate. But the work that you're planning has to really directly and clearly relate to the priorities and outcomes of this program um, for it to, to succeed in, in your application. You will be given a link um, to the online portal uh, that you'll need to submit your application through. Uh, 
there is a word document that we that we supply to you for your draft because it's a lot easier to work on your word document and you can you know amend it and go backwards and forwards and that's the one that you can send to me um for comment on because i can't see your um i can't see the online portal i can't see the work that you're doing on there so if you want me to give you feedback it does need to be on the, the draft word document however you cannot submit it in that format you will be able to copy and paste so once you've sort of got it to your polished final uh final item on the word doc then you can copy and paste your answers into the online portal um what i will say is please try not to leave it until the last minute to do that um it, usually the technology is all absolutely fine and there's no problems at all but if you're panicking at five to five and your computer crashes, then there might not be anything that we can do about that. So please, you know, try not to leave it till the last minute if you possibly can. Um, your costs and your budget need to be realistic. And we will have a look at that. There is quite um, uh, quite a lot of information in the guidance around what are eligible costs and what are not. Um, but within that, as well as being eligible, your costs do need to be realistic. So. We will question um, if something looks completely unlikely or or like you've just plucked a number out of the air. We, you know, that, that will be questioned and, and, and challenged. So do try and make that as realistic as you can. Obviously, we know that there's, there's always a bit of uh, flex within that because things don't always come out quite as planned. But as long as you've got um, a realistic idea in the first instance, then, then that's the main thing. Uh, I've said before, make sure that you're answering the question actually asked um, again it can be very tempting sometimes when you're doing an application just chuck everything down that you want us to know which is great to a degree, but make sure that within that you're actually addressing all the points that, that have been asked in the question because again otherwise it's really possible to, to, to give your application a high school if you haven't given me the right information um, and finally, on that slide, uh, check that you've attached all the required documents before submitting. Again, it's really important and your application will not be accepted if you do not submit all the right documents. Um, can't emphasise that enough, really. Um, there's, you know, again, it's not negotiable. It's very, very clear. There's a, a checklist in the guidance and on the portal, I think, um, asking, you know, detailing all the documents that you need to submit with your application, please do that. Um, if you think that you're going to have any trouble with them or you have any questions about them or you want to check that what you've got is, is the right thing for, 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 for the documents, then please let us know. Let me know as soon as you can, as soon as you noticed it on there and you think, oh, hang on a minute, I haven't got that. Let me know because we can sort that beforehand if we have time you know there's there's lots of template policies out there if you don't have policies of your own or whatever it might be or if something that you're not sure is, is the right thing or not we can sort it and particularly regarding the financial information again there's a lot of um, detail on there about exactly what you need to submit in terms of financial information um, but if you think you're struggling or you're not sure if you've got what's needed please let us know sooner rather than later so that we can we can address that beforehand because if you just think oh well i haven't got that i'll just send it off anyway you won't get through and it might well have been something that we sorted a bit earlier and that's it on that one yes thanks becky i've just got a question in uh, what is the requirement to education if clients are already graduates um we will cover that a little bit later on um in more detail so um, I'll, I'll come back to that one if that's okay, Melvin. Just move on to the next slide. Um, so just to reiterate what, what Gail was saying earlier about things that we can do. Um, in the first instance, if you have any um, concerns or doubts as to whether your organisation and or your project are going to be eligible, then as I say, please ask that question straight away before you put too much time and effort into developing your application because quite often it's a simple yes or no um, or well not if you do that but maybe if you change the focus towards this and it went, you know there's, there's scope there but um, it's better to, to, to get that sorted at an early stage. Uh, we can also answer any questions throughout the application process that you might have. I really will say um, for my own sake really please read the guidance first because a lot of the information that you're going to need is in there and it does answer quite a lot of the 
questions that you might have. However, it doesn't cover everything inevitably and you know every organisation and project is unique. Um, so there may well be questions that you have that directly relate, relate to your um, circumstances. Um, and please, please ask, we'd, as I say, much rather that you ask the question um, because basically what we want to do is, is to try and give you the best possible chance of being successful in your application. So anything that we can do to support that, um, more than happy to do it. So you'll have my contact details, you'll have my email address um, come through to you as soon as you submit your expression of interest so you can get in touch and we can go from there. Um, as I said, I can also help you um, around the supporting documents, documents and we can give, we can give feedback on the drafts of your application. Um, as Gail said, though, please um, don't leave that till the last minute, because if everyone suddenly sends me full drafts in the last uh, week, I'm not going to be able to get through them all. If you do want um, to give me an actual draft application, then ideally I need those by close of play um, on the Monday, the 8th of March, just to give me time during that week to, to get the feedback and for you to make any necessary changes. Um, that's not to say um, that I won't be able to help at all during that week. Um, so if you do have questions or last minute panic or, or queries about things, then of course I will be contactable all during that week, same as, as, as the weeks before. But if you do then sort of you know, full feedback, then obviously that takes a bit of time. Okay, so the next few slides really are, are sort of um, generally about funding applications, but, but also sort of specific to this application. So again, some of it might seem like common sense, but you'd be surprised actually how how often some of these are, are forgotten. And when you're caught up in, in, in the project and the here and now, then it can be quite easy to, to, to slip up on some of these. So just, you know, take a breath, remind yourself of, of some of these points. So missing information, I think, is, is always the biggest one. Um, so this could be documents, but it could be missing answers to questions. You might have only um, answered half the question if it asks for a couple of different elements. Or quite often it's actually that you have answered the question, but you just haven't given us enough information to really make a judgment. And as I say, you have to, to remember that the panel is basing you know, their whole judgment on, um, on the information that you give in the form. So if you've, if you've answered a question with a couple of lines or you know, a, a small paragraph, it's not necessarily going to give them the amount of information that they need to really, really give an informed opinion on that. So uh, the evidence of need, again, you need to show why you've Think this project is necessary so again it's very easy sometimes to, to think of a fantastic idea for a project um based on your skills and what you'd like to do and and all of that's completely valid but you need to demonstrate that actually it's what people need in the area that you're you're planning to do the work in um, then there's things around making sure that you've got the capacity to take on the project. There is quite a lot of admin, particularly around the claims, which we'll come on to later. So you do need to make sure that you have that capacity as well as um, the capacity to actually deliver the activities of the project. Um, procedures need to be in place if, it's, if you're working with children or, well, not in this case, but young adults or vulnerable adults, then you need to make sure you have all the necessary safeguarding processes there. You need to plan out exactly what you want to do and it needs to be obvious from your um, application that you have planned it through. Again, it's, it's, it's one thing to have a great idea and a great concept, but you need to show that you've put the thought in and the planning in to really be able to make that a reality and to really be able to, 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 to have it as a, as a viable project. And then financially, again, you need to make sure that your, your finances are, are there. Um, one of the reasons for this, again, which we'll come on to later when we talk about the claims, is that actually for this um, grants programme in particular, there is a need to sort of almost bankroll the project for a, for a space in the middle of between claims, if you see what I mean. That will become clear later. So you do need to have um, some kind of financial stability just to ensure that you, that you have the capacity to do that. Thanks, Becky. Just before we move on to the next slide, there's an awful lot of feedback going on. Can I just ask everybody to mute themselves um, 
whilst we're talking because I'm not sure where the, the feedback is coming from. So if you're not already on mute, please, can you do so? Thank you. Oh, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, and these are again some just some common mistakes that we see, not just in, in this grants programme, but in, in, you know, all sorts of funding applications that people do. So around uh, being really clear what the project would do, as I say, quite often people can articulate um, their idea, they can articulate where they want it to get to, they can articulate um, where people are going to be at the end of the support but actually sort of forget about the middle stage of, well, this is actually physically what we're going to do um, to get people to this point. So you need to be really clear on, on the actual activities of the project and not say, you know, we're going to we're going to help them get into this by building their confidence. Well, that's great. But how exactly are you going to do that? Um, inadequate staffing. Um, again, these are not huge projects, so this one might not be quite so relevant for, for some of these, but you do need to make sure that you've got um, sufficient staff time in there to, to, to really handle all the different elements of the project that you need. You need to be able to demonstrate how you're going to be able to monitor and evaluate the work that you're doing. There is a question specifically around um, monitoring and processes around there. And um, this one sort of referenced earlier, but it's really important because it, it is something that we see um, quite often is, is about making sure that your project is clear on how the progressions will be achieved. So again, it's, it seems to be a step that a lot of people miss out is that, yes, this is what we're doing and, and you lay out what you're doing and that's fine. And, and it's that next bit. So exactly how does that help people progress? Again, it might seem obvious to you, but you do need to, to, to fully explain exactly how how you'll get people to that next stage. Uh, and finally, just again, some of these are, are going over the same kind of things. Do read the guidance notes, do read the eligibility, look at the priorities. Don't try and squeeze it in if it doesn't fit. Um, I know it's tempting. We all need money. We all have good ideas that, that we want to be able to do. But it's, it's honestly, not worth your time doing if you cannot fit the um, the needs and the eligibility and the priorities of the fund. Uh, if you have any questions, as I say, please, please ask. Um, you know, we want to give this money away. We want your applications to be as strong as they possibly can. Um, so anything that we can do to support that, please, you know, we're, we're more than happy to do that. But you need to ask the questions. Make sure you're planned out, make sure you know what you want to do, make sure your budget is, is accurate and um, you're not just putting a thousand pound for everything because it's a nice easy number to work with. You know, it, it's pretty obvious when people have just done that. Um, complete all sections of the application and submit all required documents. Again, can't emphasize that one enough really. If there's gaps in the information that you're giving us or there's gaps in the documents that you're submitting, you're not going to get anywhere. So um, please keep an eye on that. Make sure you've got enough time to, 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 to do it all properly um, and to get it submitted and to gather all the documents together and all of that kind of thing. Um, and getting someone else to read your application before you submit it. Well, luckily, you know, that's that's what I'm here for as well. So, you know, by all means, get other people to read it as well. I'm not infallible, but, um, you know, if you have someone else in your organisation particularly, then it's worth getting them to read it because they understand a bit more about you and, and what you're doing. Um, but as I say, we're, we're also there to do that as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Becky. Really useful information there. Um, so what I want to talk about now is actually what happens once you've made your application. And so as we've already mentioned, the um, expressions of interest and then the full application need to be done by the 12th of March at 5pm. Um, once we've got uh, all of the applications in, we enter the stage one uh, process, uh, which goes to Becky. So she'll be looking at the first section of your application. So that's sections one to six. Um, and she will be looking at that uh, in terms of eligibility, looking at your constitution, making sure that you've attached everything that you should have done. Um, and if you haven't, then that would um, 
uh, get a failure at that point, but hopefully uh, you have done all of that so you would get a pass at uh, stage one. Sometimes we might come out to you at that point requesting a bit of a, a additional information, um, some clarification perhaps around your finances, um, but we, we may come out to you at that point for a bit more information. Uh, once you've made it past stage one, you move into stage two, um, and that's an officer scoring section. So this is from section seven uh, down to the end, and that's where there's three officers internally at SEMLEP that will score all of those sections. And as Becky was talking about earlier, uh, where there's some waiting on those sections, make sure that you've, you've filled in sufficient information to warrant that waiting. Um, so the scoring panel will um, take place at section two. And again, you could pass or fail at that section. Um, the uh, pass rate at the moment is a six. So we, we grade everything and it, it tops it all up. And if you get a six or above, then you go through to the next stage. Sometimes we take through um, some of those that are slightly below that. Um, if we haven't got sufficient applications in, the, the grant panel may consider those but our cutoff point officially is six. So uh, again, we might come out to you at that point for some additional information. So the officers might pick up some um, bits that might need clarification, uh, because what we want to do then, if you pass at that stage is carry it through to the final stage, which is the grant panel. And we want them to have all the information uh, that they need to make a decision on your grant. So the, the final stage, uh, is with the grant panel and at that point you will either be awarded or approved, approved with conditions. So again, we might need to come back to you um, uh, and get you to do a few more bits for us uh, before we can approve that or um, ultimately rejected if, if that's uh, what happens. So the timetable for that at the moment is, um, as I say, uh, we reckon we'll get through all of that by the end of April. So the grant panel is sitting towards the end of April. Depending on how many applications we have, uh, we'll be looking to award uh, with a start around early May. Um, and that's when we'll issue the contracts. Okay, so once we've um, actually issued the contracts, what happens next? Um, well, you'll get a call from either myself, Alison or Heidi, and we'll set up a project inception meeting with you. And we'll basically go through the whole project with you and highlight all the paperwork, which as you'll find out shortly, there is a lot of. So we'll go through that in some detail with you just to make sure uh, you know what you need to do. I know many of you have done ESF projects before, probably quite familiar with the, uh, the paperwork, but we just have our way of doing things. So we'll go through with you um, in some detail. And then we'll be requiring monthly reporting from you. So this is a, a, another piece of paper that you need to fill in. Um, and that will come to uh, one of the three of us. And we'll just make sure that everything's on track. If, if we feel that like things are going slightly wrong, we'll, we'll be in touch, but hopefully everything will be, will be on track. We also do quarterly uh, meetings for all the providers, a chance for you all to get together, share best practice, probably some of the challenges you've been faced with as well. It's a useful forum for that um, because many people are in the same boat. And ultimately you will get paid uh, in four tranches. So um, we'll talk in a bit more detail about that. And as Becky's already alluded to, you get your first payment up front, but all your subsequent payments are in arrears. So that, that sort of bridge, that gap between that first payment to your second payment, you need to be able to cash flow that, uh, as Becky has already said. So, okay, so I'll just check to see if we've got any questions. Um, so we've got one, uh, what is the length or expected timeline of the project? So we are usually looking for projects to be from six to 12 months. Um, so it's obviously down to you as to how long you need. And there is a, a process in place if you do need to change that. So if you signed up for six months, but actually whatever reason, you're gonna need a, a little bit of extra time. There is a project change request uh, process. So you can change things even when you've started the project. And as, um, as Becky said about 
the project costs as well sometimes uh, they can be slightly different to what you'd anticipated so again we would do a project change request for that so if we've got no more questions at this stage i will hand over to ali thank you so I'd like to do um, a brief overview of the evidence that will be needed throughout the lifetime of your project. As Gail's mentioned before, there is quite a lot. So if you are um, successful in your grant award, then we'll go with it more, uh, go through it more with you then. Um, but to be eligible for support from the ESF, an individual must be legally resident in the UK and able to take paid employment. It's expected that the ESF support for unemployed people will be used to move individuals into work or closer to employment by providing vocational training, information, advice and guidance. So to provide evidence of their eligibility, the, um, you'll need to provide proof that they're able to reside and work in the UK, and that will either be by a passport, a visa or birth certificate. You'll need evidence that they're unemployed or economically inactive, and also that they meet your eligibility criteria. So if you're doing an over 50s project, then the participants would be over 50. Some of the forms that, um, well, the main forms that you'll need to complete are the enrolment forms. And this will be completed at the first engagement that the participant has with you. And you will also capture the eligibility evidence, the passport, the birth certificate or visa at that point. If a participant is being referred by Job Centre Plus um, and some people don't have a passport or a birth certificate, they've mislaid it. So Job Centre Plus could do a referral form and on that form they would state why that person is eligible. Um, they might have seen something and then you can then decide whether you're happy with that and take them on the programme. They'll do an individual learning plan at the start of the programme. And this is really to record what the participant needs. You're going to set their goals and then record the learning aims that have taken place. Now, because it's a live document throughout the project, you'll then have your um, update meetings that will go on there. And also, you know, it might come out halfway through that they want to do something else as well. So you'd update the learning plan. Any activity that the participant has with you will need to go onto a timesheet. Everything needs to be recorded on that timesheet for us to be able to say that they've completed the programme. And then at the end, there's an exit form that they would complete. And this is really just to um, show how your project has helped them um, and what they've got out of it, really. If your participant goes on to education um, or employment, and that can also be for, um, with another training provider. So it doesn't necessarily need to be at a college. They can progress to somebody else who's delivering training but obviously, you know, it needs to be a different activity than what they've covered with you. So if they do move on, then you would complete a progression form, which would also have all the evidence needed to claim that, which we'll go on to in a minute. If you're doing face to face training, all forms, everything that your participant does with you needs to have a wet ink signature. If you're doing online training, because at the moment we have got a relaxation on wet ink signatures, but you need to have an audit trail. Now that could be by an email. So the participant has, you've had your one-to-one -one meetings and you've checked all the um, eligibility evidence. The participant completes the enrollment form. They would then send that to you on email. Now your evidence would be the email plus the attachment because ESFA, when they come to do the audit, they want to see the original attachment on that email so that what we're providing them. So there needs to be a clear audit trail for that. Thanks, Sally. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. So one is if we manage to get more people than our target into employment and not so many into education, how will that affect our targets? 
that would, well, would that be through the change request? Yeah, so I think that's probably uh, what we need to say. Yeah. You'd need to do a project change request in order to facilitate that. Yes, so it would be possible, um, but obviously when you're contracted with us, then um, we go by your application on your outputs. It, at the later date, if you have got more into employment than education, you would do a change request, which we would send out to you, where you would then um, adjust your figures accordingly. So you would still have your total um, STO1s, your up your uh, PGA ones, which is your employment, and you'd reduce the education outputs. Thanks, Sally. We've also got another one around, and actually they're pretty similar uh, uh, questions about if a person is unemployed but not claiming, how do we prove it? And also if the person is inactive in the labour market and not claiming benefit, is he or she still eligible? So really, with the um, if they are employed and don't have any um, benefits to show as the evidence, you can. Um, there is um, a self declaration form that you can complete, but you would need to go through a four step process. So one of our um, preferred methods of um, unemployment is that they're registered with the job centre plus and they've got a letter from them so that would be fine if they don't have that because they're not claiming anything then you have to then work out you know is that participant um raising a family or not working at the moment because they're raising a family or or something like that and you you can record that on your um, on an SCD 21, which is a self declaration. Sorry, that sounds a bit <laughs> blurred at the moment. Um, but it's, it's what we ask for is you have to document why they can't provide it, what they could provide you, and why that's credible. So as long as you, you, are, you can be sure that that person is unemployed, at your induction meeting, you will talk about all of the evidence. You'll have a one-to-one -one discussion about their um, circumstances, and then you make the decision at that point whether you think what they're telling you is credible. Thanks, Ali. Answer it. Sorry, <laughs> it I is think it's so. difficult to to explain at the moment. And we will go through this in much more detail on you know when when we get you up and running anyway. Yes. So we'll go through the four step process in some detail. And there is there's a there's a big document on the four step process that you can't quite um, condense at the moment. It is quite a big um, uh, document. Okay, another question: If you have no recourse to public funds, can you take part? As long as they have um, the right to work, because ESF is about um, that they live in, that they have the right to live and live and work in the UK. So as long as they can work in the UK, then we can accept them if they don't have any recourse to public funds. Okay, another question. What about if they are unemployed and you can guarantee employment post the course you deliver and further education is not as prevalent as one of your outcomes? Can your aims within the application be more geared towards gainful employment or does there need to be equal emphasis on, on the outcomes? So I could probably answer that. The, yeah. the, uh, eligibility at the moment, the criteria at the moment is we have to have 14% into education, 17% into employment. So that's the prerequisite of your applications. So uh, it doesn't have to be equal, but there are a, a percentage there within the criteria. Okay, I think there's one other question. Um, can you employ a relative 
if she is at the moment on universal credit? I haven't actually tried that one. <laughs> no, I've not. I've come across um, that I can't see why not, as long as, obviously, I suppose, I can't see why not, but I think I need to go back and look at some um, guidance on that because I'd hate to give the wrong answer. Um, I don't think I've seen any guidance, but I will double check. Okay, so we'll come back to you on yeah. that one, if that's all right. Uh, there may be others that we can't answer um, uh, at this stage, so um, we might need to come back to you. So we'll come back to you on that particular one. Okay, I will put the next slide on. Um, yes, yeah, so the um, progressions. Progression um, needs to happen within 28 days from them completing the final learning aim. And it needs to be that they actually start either in education, training or employment. We can't have an offer letter within that 28 days and them not actually starting the post for another two months or something. It needs to be they have gone into education, training or employment. OK, we have got another question. Um, with the current market, and we are running a course to get them back into employment instead of education, as many 50 plus candidates need work as opposed to education. Um, so I, I suppose that comes back to that split again, doesn't it, between education and employment. So we do uh, unfortunately need both as part of our criteria. Um, on, on the community grants. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. So evidence into um, paid employment, this can either be full-time or part-time. So it would be a letter on letter-headed paper or with a company stamp from the employer confirming the participants full-time, part-time employment, the start date and the hours contracted. Or you can have an email from the employer which shows the employer name, their title and the company details, start date and the hours contracted. Or we can have a contract of employment from the participant and it can be redacted to take out some of their personal information. For self-employed, it will be a copy of the letter from HMRC, evidence in registration, a bank statement for a business account, or registration with Companies House. Education would be a copy of enrolment or registration form, where applicable, a copy of the college ILR, or a signed letter of confirmation of enrolment from the provider, so another training provider. The above evidence must show the participant's name, course title, level of course, and guided learning hours. Ali, it might be worth just giving a, a, a few up sort of uh, examples of the type of education people are progressing into. So I know we've had quite a lot of questions around that education um, piece. Some, are, some of our participants have um, gone on to do online training with um, Open University. Um, some trainers have got uh, participants have gone on to do a college course at local colleges um, and some have um, you know gone on to another provider so where um, you know you've done your part of the, um, the training and it comes out that actually they need uh, the participant wants to go off into another I don't know, childcare or something, then um, some of them have moved over to another training provider, um, not necessarily a college, that actually does training for childcare or child minding. So it's, it's, with the education, it's not necessarily a college that we're looking at, but it's, you know, from your meeting with that participant, um, you could do CV writing and all of that, but then at that point, they would then say that, you know, 
this is where they want to end up in and you would perhaps signpost them to the correct um, provision that was out there. And how many hours do they need to do? If it's at the same level as your course, so let's say, you know, there is no level of your course um, and then they they're signposted to a level one if they go to college and do a level one course and it doesn't really matter on the guided learning hours but we still need to know if they're doing the same level as you so if they go on to another training course that isn't a regulated activity then it needs to be 20 hours or more so all non-regulated activity is what you'll be well some of you will be doing and then if they go on to another course that's non-regulated, it's 20 hours. If they go on to a regulated, it's, it doesn't matter. But everything needs, the evidence needs to show that guided learning hours. Okay, thanks, Ali. So we've got another question. 17% um, target uh, for inter-employment. Can it be flexible, especially in light of the current employment market? And once furlough has ended, Sorry. And once furlough scheme and it's likely to get worse. So that one would again come back to the change request, because at the moment we are asking for that split. Um, but later on, then there would be a, a change request, but it would need to in that change request, there would need to be um, you'll have to document why you were looking at making the change to these to the outputs. Okay, and uh, Fam, thank you for giving us a bit more information about why you're asking the questions about uh, employing relatives. So we will definitely look into that for you yes. and come back to you at a later stage on that. So with publicity, all materials relating to your project must show the ESF logo. Um, so obviously you'll have all our forms and everything, but anything that you produce must show the ESF logo. An AE3 ESF poster must be displayed at your delivery location. And ideally it needs to be in a reception where members of the public can see. If you're doing online training, then that becomes a bit tricky because they won't be coming into your delivery place. So you can either have the poster behind you so that the participants can see it if you're doing um, your Teams calls or Zoom. Or on Zoom, I think there's um, a way of setting um, a background. So perhaps you could put the background as the ESF poster. I will need you to take a screenshot of that because we need to show um, that everything's being publicised. All participants must be informed about the support from the ESF and that needs to happen on day one and on our enrolment form there is a tick box where they say that they have been told about ESF. And then you need to ensure that the website includes the ESF logo. This is uh, what the um, poster will look like. So you'd have your project name, and then you'd insert the main aims of the project with a brief description. And then it has got that, it is part funded by the European Social Fund and obviously the logos. You can add your logo to it, um, but this is just a standard one that we would send to you. So, that's it for the evidence, apart from um, a copy of all your promotional materials and certified copies of participants paperwork must be returned uh, by post and electronically with your second claim onwards, which Heidi will go into more next. Thanks, Ali. So we've got another question. What if, what if we found them work experience as part of the training or a participant wants to form their own company and become self-employed? So with the self-employment, then that would go back to the self-employment evidence that you'd need to provide. But it needs to all happen within 28 days of them finishing their last learning aim with you. Um, the work experience... I don't think that will count. Um, 
but again, I would just need to double check that one um, because I think that would be um, expected as part of the course. So I will double check on that one as well and come back. Okay, great, thanks, Ali. So moving on to the next slide and uh, a new presenter, Heidi. <laughs> Hello, people. Right. I'm the one that has to do all the claims, um, which are basically quite self-explanatory, but it is important that you understand it and don't try to reinvent the wheel. We have had situations where people have tried to do their own thing and they lose all the information that we've actually put into the, the spreadsheet. What we have is a spreadsheet and we're calling it the Community Grants 11, A, B, C and D. There's four tabs to each claim and there's three claims. Your first claim is basically just an invoice that you send to us um, with all your details on it. And it should include um, your bank account details, obviously, so we know where to pay you. Um, and just a, a note, sort of saying, as in the middle box here, invoice for 25% of the services will be delivered to SEMLEP as per contract. We need your contract name and obviously your contract reference number. The first 25% of the grant is to help you set up. This claim is evidenced in your claim too. So basically you're getting so 5,000 pounds, go out, get yourself set up. And then once you're ready to put in your second claim, we need all the evidence of the expenditure from that 25% plus your expenditure for claim two. It's basically all following claims after the 25% are in arrears and they're paid against the receipts and invoices and timesheets. Great. Can Thanks. Heidi, just, just got another question in uh, before we move on to the next slide. Is it 28 business working days or just 28 days in general? So this is the evidence of progression. Yep. So Ali, that's probably one for you. Uh, Ali, are you on mute? Hey, sorry, I was doing a bit of searching for the answers on the other things. Um, it is 28 days in general so if it does sort of happen over a bank holiday then that's not taken into account unfortunately so it's 28 days from when they um finish that aim right thank you We've got another follow-up question oh just a thank you there you go right i'll move on to the next slide Right, uh, this slide, let's have a look now. This is the spreadsheet that has the four tabs, A, B, C, and D. The SCGA is the front sheet, and this is showing the money's claimed so far and what is still to come, which has to be completed. Um, again, this one has your name, your project name, the uh, project number on it, just so our finance department obviously know where it's got to go. It is quite important that you get these bits correct, obviously. All the invoices, receipts, pay is recorded and totaled at the bottom. Oh, that's for the SCGB actually, but there you go. It, I'll explain it more as, as we go through because you'll see, Gail, could we go to the, um, the next slide, which shows the SCG 11A. This is it, this is the 11A. As you can see, you've got your company name, your project name, project reference number, your date, and along here, along the bottom line one, um, that's just an example, costs relating to your STO ones, PGO ones, and PGO threes. This is for the first claim. And then at the bottom, you can see how it works out, how much you've claimed, how much we still owe you, the total grant awarded. It's um, 
one thing I must stipulate, all the yellow boxes, please do not alter. They all have a formula in them, which will work out the monies and what's owed, what's left, et cetera. Um, so it, it is literally just a case of inputting your total expenditure and all the yellow boxes will do their own, their own little thing. On the, also on the SCG 11B, we need where you put all your receipts, each receipt, each invoice, they need to correspond. So if you scan in an invoice and you're putting it in item one, marketing, Vista print, that scanned invoice also needs to show item one. It just makes life a lot easier for us. You can imagine if we're going through 40 different claims, um, the amount of paperwork we can end up with, if we can go, right, that's one, that's one. So we can follow it through. Any timesheets, we must have the timesheets showing um, you know, how staff, the hours that staff have done and what they've been paid. Think of it as an audit, because if anybody comes in, which they do, the ESFA, um, I think they've been in twice so far, um, and they, they need to follow an audit trail. And being a claim, you really, we really need to have all this paperwork in place. I know, as you can see in here, <laughs> she's <Sorry. just> gone. <laughs> you, as it says on this one, you allocate a number to the scanned receipts and link them to the entry. You can add extra rows if you need it. There isn't a problem doing that. The expenditure, but when you fill in the expenditure claim, scan the original invoices. They must follow the item number as per your expenditure spreadsheet. We also need bank statements and credit card statements, if you've used um, credit cards, showing all the defrayal so that we can follow it through the bank. Again, just think audit and we'll all be <laughs> on the same hymn sheet. Complete all the boxes. Don't change any of the formulas within the spreadsheet. As I've said, these will automatically update. And it, it, that part has always been a problem. Somebody's always tried to change it and then it gets into one mess. And even I can't sort it out. I have to go to Gail because she's the one that <laughs> knows how all these formulas work. But um, yeah, please don't change any of the formulas that are within there. Um, Yeah, this is something that we're bringing in. It, we brought it in with round four and round five. Claim two, we need your expenditure evidence, but we also need the participants signed enrollment forms before any monies can be released. Um, we brought this in because, you know, we end up with a backlog and then we just can't get through it all. So please be aware, we need participant signed enrol enrollment forms. With all the I think just, uh, just to add to that as well, Heidi, it's also a chance for us to check that you're filling in everything yeah. right rather than leaving it all to the end. So uh, yeah, so we true. can have sight of those forms and then help you if uh, they need any correcting. Um, so we have got a question. OK, we've got somebody leaving. OK, thank you for participating. Goodbye. <laughs> this is what we don't want. Um, you can scan in several receipts all in, you know, onto one page. That's fine. We don't want little bits of paper like this being sent in at the moment. It, it's, it's no good to us. With the pandemic situation, we just need everything scanned. You can attach bus receipts to one A4 sheet. Um, food, if you've had to go out for, you know, tea, coffee, things like that. Just put scan them all in onto an A4 sheet of paper and scan into me. We'll collect all the uh, all the receipts towards the end of the uh, of the program. So keep hold of them. Don't lose them because we will need them at the end. Um, Great. Yeah. Thank so you, Heidi. Yeah, that's you done. Um, so that is the end of our um, workshop. Uh, before we finish, are there any additional questions at all? Okay, well, 
you know where we all are. So if anything else uh, does arise, then uh, do check in with any one of us. And as we've said before, there is a lot of information on our website, um, and particularly the uh, criteria. Um, oh, I think we have one last question. Okay, just a thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank our presenters this afternoon. So thank you very much to Becky, Alison and Heidi. And we look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you very much. Bye bye.